I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the climate change uh, science communication problem, uh, I guess from the perspective of the, the science of, of science communication. Um, and, and the science of science communication uh, it relies on uh, various disciplines, uh, social psychology, uh, communication, political science, to try to understand um, the process by which ordinary citizens uh, are able to recognize sound science that's of consequence uh, to their lives. Um, but really, it, the, the, the reason that there is a science of science uh, communication is because there is uh, this uh, science communication problem. Um, and, and it's to try to understand that um, and maybe try to, to figure out ways to resolve it um, that uh, the people use the methods I'm describing to look at this process. The, the science communication problem just is uh, the, uh, the, the failure of ample, valid, widely disseminated science to quiet public conflict um, over facts that are policy relevant um, to which that scientific information speaks, maybe very authoritatively. Um, obviously, climate change is the most conspicuous uh, example of that. Um, but it's not the only one. Um, historically, actually, the, the, uh, the, the disposal of nuclear waste was an issue like this and actually was the, the controversy. Why doesn't the public agree with scientific consensus? Um, that kind of got this field going, and that's what the National Academy of Sciences was initially pulling its hair out about, right? But, but there are also uh, other issues today that are like this. The CDC says that uh, uh, middle school girls should be vaccinated against the HPV virus, and there's tremendous dispute. Right? Why does this kind of thing happen? Um, and I'm gonna, gonna try to, to give you uh, the, the answer um, from the science of, of science communication. Now, there might not be consensus um, among the scientists of science communication. I know you heard from um, John Krosnick yesterday. I don't know if specifically I disagree with him on anything, but, but we'll find out. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start by uh, trying to tell you what the, the source of the science communication problem isn't. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell you what the source of it is, or at least it is in large part. Um, and then putting those two things together, what it isn't and what it is, uh, try to identify uh, some uh, important implications for how to have effective science communication that, that avoids or, or uh, mitigates the science communication problem. All right, so start out with what the source of the problem uh, isn't. Um, it, it isn't a deficit in public rationality. <laughs> this is actually, I think, the dominant understanding, so I'm even going to call it the public irrationality thesis. Um, among all kinds of observers, including uh, some social scientists, I think mainly though ones who haven't attended so much to the science communication problem, uh, but the argument goes something like this. <laughs> Ordinary members of the public, they don't know much science. They're science illiterate. A as a result, it's very difficult for them to understand the kind of information that scientists are presenting to them about climate change. And also, uh, very easy to mislead them with, with the misinformation. What's more, ordinary members of the public don't think like scientists, right? They don't think reflectively, consciously, logically, okay, slow in the way Kahneman says. They think viscerally, <laughs> instinctively, affectively, okay, fast in the way Kahneman says. Okay? And it turns out that climate change, <laughs> images of, of ice melting or polar bears and swimming, not nearly as gripping as the kinds of associations when you use fast thinking that you're gonna have for other kinds of risks, like terrorism, planes sticking out of buildings and so forth, that people will actually, because they use this fast thinking, perceive to be higher in significance or magnitude than they really are, right? So climate change kind of falls by the wayside, right? Now, that's offered as a, as a kind of just conventional explanation of what's going on 
right? But really, it's just a hypothesis. <laughs> you know, why shouldn't it be tested with some evidence? Right, so here's some evidence that bears on the public irrationality thesis. So we can just ask a, a large nationally representative sample of Americans how seriously they regard climate change risks. Right? And here, here I've, kind of, I've normalized their response. They actually answered on a scale of 1 to 10. I don't think there's a right answer. It's, it's 6.8. No, no, it's 8.3. The, the point is that you ask a question like this so that you can look at variance and, and see right, who is less concerned, who's more concerned, and test hypotheses about why it is that uh, the average member of the public, who have now kind of put their centered at zero circled, isn't as concerned as he or she should be relative to how serious a matter scientific consensus says that it is, right? So the public irrationality thesis generates a hypothesis. If the reason people aren't as concerned about climate change as they should be relative to scientific consensus is they don't know very much science and they're not very good at this kind of technical reasoning, the slow reasoning, then the, the more science that they know and the better they are at technical reasoning, presumably the, the more their concerns should approach those of the scientific consensus, more concern than the average member of the public. Right? So we can test this hypothesis, and, and here's what we find. Right, the, so we, we, we collected information on the science literacy of our subjects using the National Science of Foundation science literacy test. It's one that, that shows we're falling behind all the other countries like Japan and so forth. Right, and, and the prediction is that people become more science literate, they're going to be more concerned. This is what we see. Right, they're actually slightly less concerned. Um, but, it, but it's really close to zero. Right? The point is it isn't in the direction you would predict if you had the public irrationality thesis. Now, now that's science literacy. We also did numeracy, their, their ability to handle quantitative information, which is a good proxy of whether they're using the slow system two reasoning. Right? So but now see, see what happens with this. It, it's the same thing. <laughs> right? As people become more numerate, better able to handle quantitative information, more disposed to use the slow, deliberate, rather than the fast kind of reasoning, they don't become more concerned about climate change on the whole. Right? It may be a little bit less, but really the point is it's pretty close to zero. Right? And, and this is our work, but this is, I think, the consensus of people who look at the science of science communication. The knowledge deficit hypothesis, people don't know what's going on, is not the explanation. Right? So what is? <laughs> What the, the, the source of the problem is motivated reasoning. I mean, this is one of the sources. It doesn't matter what it is. Is the source, all of it, right? But a lot of the problem comes from motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning refers to the tendency of people to fit their assessments of information of all kinds, you know, archaeological arguments, the, the position of authority, even what they see with their own eyes to some interest or goal that is collateral to simply getting the correct answer. A classic study was the, the, called they, they saw a game. They took the college students from two Ivy League schools. and They said, watch this film of the controversial calls by the referee in the football game between your two schools. And all the Penn students said, that referee was calling so many penalties on Penn. What was wrong with him? And the Dartmouth students said, calling so many penalties on right? This is motivated reasoning. The emotional stake that they had in belonging to those groups, affirming their commitment to them, was actually affecting what they see. Right? And the point here is that we are members of teams or groups. Right? And the stake we have in affirming membership in those groups is influencing how we perceive the evidence on climate change, including even what the, the evidence of what scientific consensus is. Because that's another thing. You can't, you just says you can't go to the North Pole and measure the ice there. You, say, you don't do surveys of scientists. You're relying on information around you about what most scientists think. Right? Here, in our work, there are different ways to assess what these teams are. <laughs> I think they're just all alternative measures. And you can talk about why one's better or another. But, but we use the, the uh, 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 framework that looks at people's values along two dimensions. And they're just relatively straightforward. 
How individualistic are people? How kind of group oriented? How much do they like to have uh, very explicit rankings based on clear identities and roles and more hierarchic? Or do they think nobody is entitled to tell other people what to do because of who they are? They're more egalitarian. These kinds of dispositions will, will, will uh, cause people to have certain or be, be disposed to form certain kinds of risk perceptions that reflect and reinforce those views. People who are more hierarchical and individualistic tend to be skeptical about environmental risk because they, they perceive uh, unconsciously that if you credit those kinds of claims, that that's going to result in restrictions on commerce and industry. And, and those are things that are important in their way of life. People who are more egalitarian and communitarian, right, that they tend to already be suspicious of commerce and industry, and, and therefore they find the claim evidence that those activities are dangerous to be more congenial. That's the theory, and we've actually done all other kinds of risks too. I mean, it's not, climate change is not singular. Right? And here's what we see. Again, just as kind of a reference point, science, literacy, and numeracy, you combine them in the scale. They don't explain very much of the variance. Right? Here, here's how much variance is explained. You take an average member of these groups. It's a lot. You know, these people are almost two standard deviations away from each other. I, I don't know how to, how, uh, it's, it's a big difference. That's why we have the conflict. We know what the conflict is. These are the kinds of groups that are disagreeing, right? And you know, that's more than, than the, 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 the science literacy, numeracy, but that's not really the interesting point. Look at how these things interact with each other. What do you think is gonna happen as people who have values like this become more science literate or become better at handing, handling technical information and doing system two reasoning? Do you think that among the people who, are the, who know the most science, and who are the most adept at technical reasoning, you have more polarization or less? Now, you might say less, because they know what they're talking about. And if you don't know any science, you can't think like a scientist. You go with your gut, and it's filled with crap, like culture or something. Right? Well, people who, egalitarian communitarians become slightly more concerned as they become more science literate and numerate, and the higher individuals become less concerned. All right, so the gap that was already pretty significant between the members of those groups who were low in science literacy, right, that was significant, but it gets even bigger as people become more science literate, more numerate, and one way to think about it is that everybody's motivated to try to form the perceptions that fit the ones that are predominant in their group. If you're really good at science and you're good at with numbers, you're even better at that. Right? You can get some books and read up about it and figure out counter arguments and so forth. This has implications, by the way, for the significance of misinformation. Sign misinformation is very significant, right? but it's still possible to, to misunderstand why it's significant. Right? That there's a kind of tendency to have this model that there are external <laughs> sources of misinformation, interests that have an interest, want to misinform people, they feed misinformation to a credulous public, right? and as a result, they're confused. Well, there's a motivated public that wants to find information that supports what they want to believe, because they want, there's a group that wants to believe that climate change isn't a serious risk, there's going to be profit to be made and success to be had in supplying them with misinformation. Because you have that motivated group out there, you're not going to win a war of attrition where you just keep pouring more facts on the other team until it goes away. You have to do something about why people who have these dispositions react in the way they do to the information. Right? And so that's where we get to the, the what to do about this. Right? And I'm going to just quickly two-channel strategy, I'm going to call it. Right? That, that there are two channels of, of communication in science communication. One is content. You, you, the, you want to convey sound information, and you want to convey it in a way that's comprehensible to a person of ordinary intelligence, not an expert. And there's actually a science of how to do that. It's not easy. Right? But it's not impossible either. The, the, the second channel is meaning. People are assessing the information to determine, unconsciously, whether assenting to it is going to connect them to their group, their team, or 
estrange them to, from their team, put a, drive a wedge between them and their team. If they perceive, because they're getting the signal along the meaning dimension, that that information is something their assent to will be bad for their standing in their community, then they're going to turn off and they're going to react in a closed-minded way. Right? If, if, the, if the, inf the information coming along the meaning channel is, is affirming or not threatening, then they'll be open-minded. So you want to have the two channels be connected to each other and be, be aligned given the audience that you're talking about. Now quickly, just a, an example of what I'm talking about. I do a study here where we show people information it, it, from it's, it's, it's actual information. We, we, we combined it from a, a Nature article and a, 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 the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences article on how carbon dissipation in the atmosphere is much more sluggish than people thought. That even if you phase in limits and put a cap at 450 to 600 parts per million, we're still going to have catastrophic effects. In fact, even if we stop today to produce carbon, there's going to be all kinds of irreversible bad effects. And then we ask our subjects, you know, how convincing do you find this? And not surprisingly, we're going to find that the hierarchical individualists. Right. They're more skeptical. They'll say things like computer models aren't any good, scientists are biased, so forth. But that's in a control condition, right, where people first read an article about a big dispute over the stoplight on Elm Street. There are two other conditions. One is called the anti-pollution condition, where first they read a story where scientists said you have to have more emission controls. Right? And in that condition, the two groups are even more polarized. In the geoengineering condition, Right? They read information where scientists say, we need more research on geoengineering. Right? And in that condition, there's less polarization. Right? The, 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 the least amount of polarization, hierarchical individuals are least, less likely to, to be dismissive toward this information of the geoengineering condition. There's no logical connection between the validity of the information about how quickly carbon is dissipating from the atmosphere and what we should do in general about climate change. Right, so it, what we're going to do doesn't affect whether there, there's something to be done, but that information about what we might do is traveling along the meaning channel. The reason hierarchical individualists tend to turn off to the content of the information is that it threatens their idea that we can have a society where we have markets, private ordering, technology. Geoengineering says, well, one of the ways in which we deal with the problems that we have is by using more ingenuity, by using more science, so that we can continue to do the things that are valuable to us as individuals, as consumers. That meaning is not threatening to them. Because it's not threatening to them, they're thinking more open-mindedly about the information whether there's a problem. Right? That doesn't mean that you should have geoengineering. <laughs> but we are going to investigate geoengineering. The Royal Society, National Academy of Sciences says we, you have to investigate everything. And if we're investigating these things, then we should use the fact that we're investigating these things as a kind of communicative resource along Channel 2 to convey to people who have the sensibility that's threatened by the current meaning of climate change that thinking about this problem doesn't mean denigrating your way of life. Right? But that's, the, that, you know, that's a, an instance of the two-channel channel strategy. Figure out ways to combine the content with meanings that are affirming rather than threatening of the values of these, of these groups, and you can counteract the motivated reasoning. So that's the, that's the answer. And, the, and we, we also, well, I don't have time to talk about these experiments, but they're very important too with the cat. The cat. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dan, that was terrific.